Troublemaker Start. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest event as part of our Sustainable Business Series. I'm Raj Kandola, Head of Policy at the Chamber. I'd like to welcome you all to today's event. Now, for those who are not familiar with the Sustainable Business Series, uh, we set it up last year. And in essence, it was set up to help those local businesses keen to embark on their own net zero journey. Now, throughout the month of October this year, we've run a series of webinars and in-person events covering a range of topics from helping businesses reduce their energy usage, um, decarbonizing key sectors, and the, the campaign will culminate with an in-person conference taking place next week on the 2nd of November uh, at the Exchange Building. Uh, our keynote speakers include Andy Street, West Midlands Mayor, and Michaela Wright, uh, Head of Sustainability at HSBC UK. Now, these events are all free to attend thanks to our sponsors, Aston University, University of Birmingham, and Shakespeare Martino. And over the summer, obviously, we saw examples of extreme weather, and we had a number of conversations with businesses around what they would do in the future to uh, adapt to this type of uh, activity. And really, this is what today's event's all about, climate risk and adaption. I'm delighted to say that we're joined by three uh, excellent speakers to talk about this topic today. So first, we'll hear from Marcel Ridyard, Associate Director at AFL Architects. Then we'll hear from Jessica Wilkes-Ball, Sustainability Manager at Mills & Reeve. And finally, Emma Head, Technical Services Delivery Director at HS2. Essentially, this session is all about helping businesses understand what climate risk means for their organization and how businesses are preparing for those risks moving forward. Um, so in terms of um, a, a format for today's event, as I said, we'll hear very shortly from our three speakers. Um, and that should leave us around 20 minutes or so for um, a Q&A session. So again, if you've got any specific questions, feel free to post them in the chat box or email us directly and we'll run through them from there. And we should be finishing at 10 o'clock. So again, uh, please do get those questions in. And without any further delay, I'd like to bring in Marcel. Marcel, over to you. Good morning. Just want to check everyone can see my screen. That's not working. Uh, we can't see the slides just yet. So bear with me. Are we there now? Not quite. It says you've started sharing the slides, but we can't see them just yet. Yes, yes, we can. Fantastic. There we go. I'm more of a Teams man, so I have to get used to Zoom, but there we go. So, so I wanted to phrase uh, this morning's session based on building in green infrastructure resilience. And I know this topic will probably get repeated and looked at from different perspectives uh, in some of the other speakers' talks. But what the, the perspective I am interested in is certainly where our head office is based in Greater Manchester. I want to look at it from our perspective and <clears throat> the part of the struggle we're having to actually get green infrastructure um, implemented as a kind of brief item or a, or a, or a policy item. So obviously the surging construction projects, particularly in Manchester, but it's being seen all around the country, um, will cement itself as a thriving global destination. Manchester will become um, bigger than uh, Birmingham, potentially, and may even become Britain's official second city. So at the moment, if you walk around Manchester, if you ever visit the city, you'll see these towers are, are, are throwing up and some of these pictures are yet to be built. So one of the campaigns um, that certainly we've been behind is to get green roofs, green walls, and currently trying to get more timber used in, in, in architecture. If we look at green roofs specifically, uh, they have so many benefits and they're often not discussed enough within um, the construction uh, area. They tend to get used in uh, green belts for planning game because you're hiding the building, but they don't get discussed as part of uh, a green agenda. So winter, they minimize heat loss because they're actually a thermal blanket on the roof. In, in summer, they protect the building from the heating and they can be more effective than insulation. All the more green infrastructure, particularly if every roof in Manchester or London or, or another city had a green roof, they actually reduce the urban heat island effect. Green infrastructure reduces the local temperatures. Um, they reduce 
uh, ground level ozone if they're at low podium level. So uh, any low low level podiums um, near office buildings, the more the more green infrastructure you have at that street level, they help reduce ground level ozone. They catch dust, they cool ambient temperature and improve air quality. They also uh, protect roof membranes lasting up to twice as long as conventional roofing. Now, and that's quite an important one. There's a lot of people who think, oh, if I put a green roof out there, it's more maintenance, my roof's gonna leak. They're all kind of myths. In fact, if you put a good quality roof membrane in, which is high spec, and then put in a, a, a green roof, your roof will actually potentially perform better and have less maintenance. And if you have green roofs where you have a cafe or again, a podium, or you look out onto it, it can increase property value because you, you're telling your occupants of that building, look, you have this great resource. Roofs have been for so long that the place where nobody's allowed. A few years ago, leading up to Andy Burnham's Green Summit um, in the late teens, we produced this uh, video to go kind of viral across Manchester and, and uh, on social media to say, look, wouldn't this be wonderful to create uh, an amazing park in the sky? And we did this in uh, always a support of Manchester City of Trees and the GMCA. So obviously there's buildings and projects where green roofs and green infrastructure is being put into uh, architecture already. So the message is getting out there, which is great. Um, City Trees and other tree organisations around the country are helping to plant trees and encourage trees being built in city centres. And of course, we can all get involved in actually raising awareness by attending events, making events and doing things. So how we work, what we're trying to do is start with green roofs on buildings, start with timber and, and fight for it as far as we can. Um, this example here was a, a, a training centre for Chelsea FC in Cobham and it had a green roof. It was in a green belt and this was very much a green roof to, to deal with a planning situation. But the natural materials of brass on the, on the side, which weather and green roof helped the building set into the, to the environment. A more recent example is Gloucester Gateway Service Station, which many of you may have stopped at um, being um, on the M5. And the Westmoreland family have built uh, one slightly different to this, but it's more quite famous up in uh, Cumbria. But this is the first one down um, in near the Cotswolds. And the idea is to blend not only with a green roof, but actually make it feel like it's part of the earth. And the, uh, the seed mix, which is being used on here, is to mimic the natural wildlife and the, the, the grasslands and the Cotswolds on one side and Ronwood Hill on the other. Buildings as far as China, again, we're taking this mission. So wherever we do a project, we're trying to encourage sustainable materials and green infrastructure. It's again, a training center in China. You, all we can do is put this into the architecture and, and, and make sure that it's top down and as much of it is retained. So that's building and designing new buildings, but could you put green roofs on existing infrastructure? Uh, and this is kind of what we were, the mission, the mission in Manchester and, and, and potentially in London, because I know London has a green roof plan. I don't know, I don't believe Birmingham has a, um, a specific plan at the minute, but like Manchester, it could too look to adopt it in its spatial strategy. So in London, about 32% of central London can structurally be green roofed tomorrow, subject to just checking. In city of Manchester, a quick estimate based on the building stock in the type of flat roofs there, it's about 15% could have a green roof tomorrow. Other towns and centres, it could be 10 to 15%. Obviously, is there any finance? How, how do you pay for this? Why would you be doing it? So it's kind of, it's an encouragement to say, look, when you refurbish your building, think about it in, in, the, in that stage. Uh, there's also the urban greening factor, which could be used in planning policy. And, and this is uh, used around Europe and it's used in um, uh, London. You essentially say if the building footprint, including your public realm, is a, a square, you, you set a percentage of that that has to be um, certain um, types of green. 
and it could be non-permeable surfaces all the way to permeable paving, extensive green roof to a woodland, trees and deeper soil. And essentially you get a target and a score. It's essentially out of 100, but it gets uh, put it into uh, a percentage of one. Um, so that's in the GLA New London plan. And it's generally working as an encouragement and um, all developers have to demonstrate how they've achieved that. So as I said, in London, it's not mandatory, but expectation. And it's gradually being adopted and most buildings now have it. So Manchester is looking to bring that in, in its um, people and places framework, but is yet to be live. Obviously, there's many examples of cities around the world, Copenhagen, New York, Amsterdam, where they've all got green roof policies. Lots of stats and figures. Uh, very quickly, so there are, we mentioned earlier about is there any way of financing any of this? So the GMCA, Greater Manchester Combined Authority, um, after the, uh, their summit, they managed to get funding for what's called the Ignition Project, which was a European funded um, um, project to, to study um, financial me uh, mechanisms for funding green infrastructure. Is there a way you can link the benefits of green infrastructure to a, a financial system to help pay for it? There's no doubt the, um, there is benefits of green infrastructure. This is everything from trees at low level, rain gardens, green walls, green roofs, it's, it's the whole thing. So there's no doubt there's a benefit, but how do you how do you turn that into, how do you monetize it? So there's lots of money for flood management, um, but there is actually a finance gap in UK for, for this. There's about 350, sorry, 354 million gap. Um, and then there's a 56 billion gap in funding for general nature ambitions. So it's not all gonna be met by public finance alone, I direct funding from the government, there, there has to be other mechanisms to bring that in. So what they were looking for nature-based solutions and adaptation was to set direction through strategy and policy, setting investment priorities, supporting projects to become investable and providing structures to develop and deliver those projects. And this is Manchester's aim to be net zero by 2038, which is a highly ambitious target because it's ahead of the UK's 2050. But it's probably better to put it in everyone's minds that we need to get moving immediately. So it's produced various documents and uh, there's lots of agendas and there's lots of detail and research in trying to value all this. Health benefits, obviously, are the first one. You know, does that save in, in, in healthcare costs? There must be ways of transferring NHS funding into green infrastructure. So essentially, they came up with ways that you could look at commercial premises, non-domestic properties, streets and alleys, new developments, all having slightly different mechanisms. So public parks could just get some uh, general funding from the GMCA. So, you know, it's a very light touch, but, but, but so that's part of the Green Spaces Fund, which is already live and already funding people um, projects. Uh, and then for all the other areas, you, you start to, to provide maybe percentage funding to some of these you know, grants. So it's a long and complicated road and having been an advisor to Ignition, but not, uh, not, not a direct um, uh, investor, we've been you know, always there to sounding board as architects in the profession, you know, how, you know what, what works and what doesn't. Um, and effectively looking at special purpose vehicles to, uh, to take money from investors and then maybe potentially that could go into site owners. So the idea is say United Utilities who are a, uh, a utility provider because they've got the water network and sewers, they may be interested in putting money into this SPV because if you put a green roof on your building, it reduces water runoff and therefore flooding is reduced. So all these ideas of where you get funding from other bodies, which potentially are public, some are private, but they all benefit from it. And you get, uh, money from other parts of the pie so uh, people who want to just grant money uh, fund it uh, the part from education could be put money in for rain gardens at schools um, which is part of education um, and etc 
So the idea is to create a Greater Manchester Environment Fund, um, and that will help fund and put grants through to design build contractors. And this is the plan uh, looking at trying to de deliver. To do this, they built a living lab, which has got equipment to test and measure, see what's actually happening, which plants live best. And they did this at Salford University in Manchester. And essentially we've got everything from a, a roof garden with different plants, all the way through to uh, draining through a, a, a living wall, down into rain gardens and tree pits. And the whole thing is connected so you can actually see how the water can move through all the different systems. And almost none of it goes off into the local river, but if there's a major uh, storm event, obviously, then it can overflow into the river. But it would, meanwhile, it's been trapped on its journey. And this was the transformation of the building. You can go and see this and just walk around it. And it's become a central part of the university. And wouldn't it be great if we could do this so all our drab uh, infrastructure in various developments, just simply adding green infrastructure, green walls, you can transform existing buildings. So that is a quick whiz through uh, that approach to greening uh, our building. I, I hope that was enjoyable and we can talk about it a bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Yeah, that was really interesting to hear about the projects that are going on around uh, green roofing across not just our country, but Europe as well. Uh, and I think later on we're going to discuss how we could perhaps implement some of those models here in the West Midlands and Birmingham as well. Um, so yes, that'd be very, that was really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so right, can I bring in Jessica, please? Hi, good morning. Morning. So do you want me to just get going? So yeah, I'm Jessica Wilkes Hall. I am the uh, Sustainability Manager at Mills and Reed, and I'm going to uh, share some slides. They're not going to be as interesting as yours, Marcel. I'm just sat here taking loads of notes. Um, what a fantastic presentation. So let me share this with you. I'm also more used to Teams. So let's go hopefully you can all see that shout if we can't raj but if i yeah, don't need anything see. wonderful right let's go um so mills and reeve um we're a very proud patron of the chamber here in birmingham and we are um we're a uk only uh, office based law firm but we actually operate across uh, internationally as well so i uh, hate to start with with bad news but um in April, the UN Secretary General basically said that um, the results are going to be catastrophic if we don't stay below one and a half degree. Um, there's been some uh, reports re released this week saying that after COP26, there was lots of promise and lots of positivity. But unfortunately, because of things that have, that have happened in the world, um, there is a real lack of uh, commitment from businesses. I'm proud to say that Mills and Reeve are very, very committed to this, and hopefully I can give you a little bit of a whistle-stop tour about how we've approached this. So um, ESG matters that are affecting business. It's become much more important uh, than the last previous 12 to 18 months. This is from a DWF report. Um, so if you want to look it up, it's really, really worthwhile. Um, you know, nearly 50% of stakeholders are saying that, that you know, there's increased pressures on ESG matters. We're finding it a lot of our work that we're doing. We're doing a lot more clauses and drafting that actually have ES, ESG at the center of it. Um, but also a universal benchmarking service is a problem. Um, there's so many standards and there's so many uh, benchmarking tools out there. It's actually a bit of a minefield. And I'm gonna to touch on that shortly to talk about how we've approached it, but also how they're how you can actually identify which ones are best for your business. So in the legal sector, <coughs> we're seeing that there are actually um, more and more uh, incidents of greenwashing and that actually, you know, um, lit litigation against uh, actions against corporates for their commitments. People are wanting more transparency and it's okay to say that you're going to be net zero by 2050, but if you don't follow that up with actual any action, you're really opening yourself up to a lawsuit. Um, in 2022, out of the uh, largest firms, um, 70 were advising on ESG, but only uh, 19 had set targets to reduce those emissions and just seven had a date to reach net zero. Um, we're very proud to say that we have committed to net zero, but it is still very much a, um, a sort of pie in the sky for a lot of law firms at the moment. That It's just not on their agenda and it really needs to be. 
So consumers are also demanding um, that sustainability is really important to them, and they're actually demanding that um, you know they want to put their money where businesses and also you know, the products that they're purchasing actually have a, a decent level of sustainability, but also making sure that their supply chain is also accountable. Um, it's also transparent and I think that scope three piece that supply chain piece is the biggest risk for for all businesses um you in scope someone's scope one is somebody else's scope three but we've got to get a handle on that on that scope three emissions so there's top five global risks um the financial times recently referred to the ESG in in investment sector as rife with greenwashing and it's really important to think about choosing your frameworks wisely uh, trust is a huge concern to consumers and responsible businesses under increasing scrutiny. Driving forward, the uh, drive the standards, but it's overwhelming and there's an awful lot of misinformation out there. So there's three main risks that are faced by businesses. There's physical liability and transition risk. Um, you'll see on this slide that actually it gives you a little bit of a definition and I'm happy to share these afterwards. But I think for us as a law firm, the liability risk is, is the bit that sort of piques our interest, um, but also lawsuits being against government and corporations and directors. You've probably seen recently about H&M uh, being taken to court, I believe it was in the Netherlands, about their claims around sustainability and the sustainable products. Um, and it was, and they lost that lawsuit because what they were saying wasn't actually what they were delivering. And we will only see more and more of that. Um, there was a really good documentary recently that um, Simon Reid did on BBC and he was uh, out in the Atacama desert and they were finding that brand new clothes from Gap etc were being taken out there and buried in this you know million year old desert because rather than reselling them on they're actually just shipping the problem to another country and I would really encourage you to go and watch that I think it was um, in Chile it was this South America series but it was really eye-opening that you know, you can say one thing that, oh, you know, this is made from plastic bottles, the label in these jeans are made from plastic bottles, but what happens to the returns that people send back? Well, they're just being buried in the desert. So, you know, put your pound wisely is what I'm saying. And I think there will be more and more scrutiny against that. So how do we minimise risks? <clears throat> For us, there's a lot of physical impacts, but also <clears throat> we want to make sure that what we're doing is a um, is, is right and that actually we want to align ourselves to those standards and frameworks that fit our business and we don't want to align to everything because we'll just look silly you know we, we've got to pick the right frameworks that fit us um, finance professional services manufacturing utility health they're all saying that actually the climate crisis is a real risk multiplier for them um, for our profession, so there's the level of complexity of litigation, and we want to make sure that those standards and frameworks that we adopt are right. Um, we work really closely with Carbon Footprints, who are brilliant, and they did our first assessment, and then they've also shown that we're actually a reduced organisation, and they've also helped to forecast our emissions to 2050. All of this is publicly available. We're very transparent with this information. Uh, we've done a carbon reduction plan, which is again on our website, but also because of the clients that we advise, we've had to do a carbon reduction plan to even be able to get our foot through the door with some of our clients. Um, and that will become a more and more of a standard. It used to be for contracts of a certain level, but actually they've dropped the level because they, they recognise the importance of having really clear and uh, trans well, transparency within their supply chain. So on the governance piece, um, there's a growing groundswell since COP26 and leading into COP27, increasing scrutiny to who actually committed to SBTI, so one and a half degree or lower. Um, it's the critical tipping point. Um, the UN released a report yesterday that uh, said that climate plans from the 163 nations of the Paris Agreement are, are insufficient and only half of business are actually decarbonising in line with SBTI. We've submitted a letter of uh, commitment to SBTI and we've now got 24 months to actually submit what our plans will be. Um, this is pretty much the gold standard for all businesses. And if there's one thing to take away is I would really encourage you to go and look at this um, for your business because it is it is the standard that's out there and you'll see what the difference between one and a half and two 
in terms of the climate related risks are significantly greater. You know, we all had that really hot weather, we had a drought, um, you know, the, the impact on the environment is huge. And, you know, we, we need to stay at one and a half degree or lower. Um, someone asked me if I was hopeful that we would stay at, at that. And professionally, I, I would like to think so. But personally, it does it does concern me that we, we may not hit that. And we've all got to collectively work together to, to keep as close to that one and a half as we can. So these are just an example of some of the um, st framework standards and memberships that we have. So this hopefully will give us a protection from accusations of greenwashing. Pick the standards that matter for you. Don't go for quantity, focus on the quality. But remember, it's a really big job. There's myself and I have a, an assistant and we spend a lot of our time uh, monitoring things. Data is really key, reporting, um, but also getting involved at the sort of at the bottom end to give our um, expertise and our advice to other small, for example, smaller law firms, etc. Um, and also we sit on the board for business in the community. Uh, we're working towards ISO 14001. We've just signed up to the UN Global Compact and we've committed to science-based targets. This is pretty much the, the sort of the, the main bag that we're going to be staying towards. So I think also this gives you an idea of, of what we're looking at. And this is from our new sustainability report, which will be released during COP. Um, this gives you a real overview of the standards and how we're trying to monitor, but also how we're trying to grow, not just our business, but also our presence and also our knowledge across the business around ESG, but mainly the sustainability piece. We're really good on the S parts of the CSR and, and our inclusion, diversity and well-being. But actually, the, the E part, I started in January and we pushed that dial massively, but we've still got an awful long way to go. Um, we're also uh, making sure that we can we continue to report under SECR, SECR guidelines and the ESOS um, that we're actually, you know, we make sure that we do everything that we should so we don't get any surprises. TCFD is coming. That's mainly at the moment re related to financial services organisations, but it is coming to organisations that are professional services with a turnover of over a certain amount. Don't ask me what it is because I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but that will start to become more of a, a framework that we will also have to report on. And finally, we are really proud that last month we committed to net zero. Uh, we've set our goals, uh, a near term target and a long term target. So our near term target is 2030 and our um, long term target is 2050. And we're looking actually at um, some really innovative carbon capture projects rather than um, looking at offsets. So we're looking at removals. Uh, for, for the majority of our scope one and two, and then we're looking at offset for our scope three. And that's my last slide. So uh, again, um, as Marcel said, let's uh, hopefully have a discussion at the end and really happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. That was great. Really interesting to see the um, the percentages that you use in terms of feedback from both clients and customers around the importance of ESG. Obviously thinking about the, the three pillars of risk that you mentioned. And I uh, look forward to seeing the uh, sustainability report, which is coming out in the next few weeks as well. Um, it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I look forward to seeing that. So, right. Can we now bring in uh, Emma, please? Hi, everyone. Um, you guys are going to share my slides, so I'll just wait for them to come up. Fantastic. Thank you. If we can go back to the beginning, brilliant, thank you. Now there's a lot of synergies in what I'm gonna talk about today and what we've already heard, but hopefully I can bring a slightly different lens. Let me first of all introduce myself. I'm Emma Head. I'm Technical Services Delivery Director at HS2. You might think, what does that mean? Uh, I look after what we build and how we build it. So the engineers, the environment and town planning team, safety, security, quality, assurance and innovation. I have a team of about 600. I sit on the exec at HS2. I've been there for the last seven and a half years. So I've seen us do quite a lot of the planning, design and now build life cycle. So I have some history about some of the decisions and the journey we're on. My career as a whole, I've spent 23 years in the rail industry and I have a background in environmental engineering. Um, today, I wanna to give you a bit of an introduction into HS2, just for some context. I wanna give you a bit of an update on where the project's at. 
talk about our commitment to uh, climate and carbon, climate change and carbon reduction, and then focus in on a couple of examples around uh, building a resilient infrastructure and adapting to the challenges we see. If you could just move forward for me, that'd be great. Thank you. So High Speed 2, for any of you who haven't heard of it or don't know about it, we're building a new high speed railway right now between Birmingham and London. Our head offices are in Birmingham and we are about connecting the UK, going up to Manchester, across to the East Midlands and down to London. Our trains will go beyond the captive network of High Speed 2 and will link four of the five largest economic regions in the UK taking us on to the Scottish Belt, North West, West Midlands and South East. We'll integrate our new lines across Britain's existing rail system, and that's to deliver faster travel for many towns and cities across Britain, not directly on the route. So people like Liverpool, Sheffield, Leeds, Nottingham and Derby will also benefit from our services. We are building 170 miles of new high-speed rail line, and that's between Crewe and London. They're already under construction. And the government is planning in total over 260 miles as we look to go on to Manchester across the East Midlands and some of the uh, East West um, issues up north as well. HS2 is being built to the highest standards. We're using world class engineering and we're looking to protect the countryside, protect local communities and cut carbon wherever we can. It's a huge undertaking. It's Britain's first new intercity railway north of London in 100 years. And it's the largest infrastructure and environmental project currently underway in Europe. If you can move forward for me again. The business case for HS2 sometimes gets lost in the name of high speed, high speed two. Actually, it's about capacity, carbon and connectivity, what we like to refer to as the three C's. You know, HS2 is designed to address some key national problems. Our railways are overcrowded and desperately need more capacity. Our economy is unbalanced and we really need to support the levelling up agenda around the Midlands and the North. Mm -hmm. And we have a huge challenge around climate change, as we've all been talking about. And as we all work towards a low carbon economy, we need to decarbonise our transport network. HS2 will support all three areas. In terms of more capacity, demand for rail travel in the UK has more than doubled in the last 20 years. Even now, post pandemic, we're back to 90% of pre pandemic usage. There will not be sufficient capacity on the network within the next 20 years. HS2 will add vital capacity to the existing network by taking long distance trains off it. That creates thousands of extra seats and space for more local commuter and freight services which is really important because it's about taking travel off the roads. In terms of cutting carbon, um, you know, we are a zero carbon alternative to long distance travel. We reduce the needs for car, lorry and plane journeys. And we're a vital part of delivering the government's ambitious goal around becoming net zero by 2050. We published our carbon action plan along with our environment sustainability vision in January this year. We made some quite bold commitments, but we also put the action plan out there because because to Jessica's points, we wanted to be credible and we wanted to be clear the journey we were on and how we saw ourselves getting there. But just a few nuggets from those commitments. Um, we already have three diesel free construction sites. We have all six electric cranes in the country on HS2 sites already. We've committed to all of our construction sites being diesel free by 2029. And we're investing heavily right now in innovation to support that target. We are looking to be carbon net zero in construction in 2035, which means we're working really hard now across the infrastructure and transport sectors to see what we can do around the big challenges of steel and concrete. I think that work is accelerating with the war in Ukraine, where we're seeing uh, prices increase and therefore environmentally more sustainable solutions becoming also more economically viable. HS2 is committed to be carbon net zero from day one of operation, and we're looking at those fuel sources now, but it's important that we reinvest in the energy sector, not just take from what's already there to make sure the overall net gain. And HS2 has been accredited to PAS 2080 as a carbon standard for the last two years. We've just gone through our recertification 
with no findings, which enables us to talk credibly to some of Jessica's points about how we're going to do this, not just what we're going to do. In terms of better connectivity, I've touched on it already in terms of who, what areas of the UK we will touch, but this really is an important economic regeneration project. We are looking to be a catalyst for growth and help to level up the country, boosting growth in the Midlands and the North and op opening up new employment opportunities for millions. If you can move forward for me again, please. Thank you. So moving now to our changing climate and the challenge that HS2 faces. HS2 is a once in a lifetime project that will benefit many generations to come. We're designing it to operate well into the 22nd century, which means this railway needs to continue to run even as we experience more and more extreme weather events caused by climate change. Our work in this area is being recognised as industry leading and we are looking to highlight best practice and where else it can be used. We need to adapt to UK infrastructure to be more resilient to more hostile and changing environmental conditions. Um, we want to be part of a climate resilient transport system. As the new high speed railway is the backbone for Britain's transport network, it's critical the railway can withstand extreme hot and cold weather, heavy rain, high winds and storms. And these are becoming more common and more extreme. Our climate is already changing and will continue to do so, even as we start to reduce global emissions. The global average temperatures are increasing and extreme weather is becoming more frequent. If emissions continue to increase and average global temperatures were to rise by four degrees, summers here will be significantly hotter. Nearly a third of the UK would see average summer temperatures above 25 and peaks of more than 40 degrees. Why is that relevant? Well, any of you who travel by trains will remember the hot temperatures we had this July and the impact it had on the conventional network operated by Network Rail. Hitting temperatures of 36 saw much of the network come to a standstill. Overhead wires fail and require repair works, which meant we were without train travel for a number of days. We have to design HS2 to be able to withstand the future that we can foresee. These projections suggest our future climate is likely to be associated with a greater chance of warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers. Major climatic trends that will impact the UK infrastructure include heavier rainfall, more flooding, erosion and more extreme temperatures. When I worked at Network Rail, I experienced two major events, Dawlish and in Warwick, where we had major embankment collapses and we had the coastal line wash away but down in Exeter. These were all down to climate change and erosion. And again, these sorts of um, major events to the infrastructure can take 12 weeks to repair. In the issue of Dawlish, that cut local communities off south for, up for a significant period, preventing travel for employment, etc. I mean, that is the case with an old network that's trying to be maintained. As we build a new network, we obviously have to take that challenge into consideration. If you can move forward for me again, please. Thank you. So what are some of the risks that we're thinking about as we build HS2? Uh, it, it will cause us to think about, you know, raising uh, river levels, more extreme flood events, more extreme temperature. Changes in climate will cause risks to the UK rail infrastructure. We need to consider those risks to our assets, infrastructure, supply chain, passengers and staff as well as biodiversity impacts. We need to be thinking about rain, heat, wind, lighting, flooding and drought and ensure the design and construction of HS2 is developed in a way that reduces or removes these risks through every step of the project. If these risks were not mitigated, they could lead to impacts on construction programme, so it could cost us money and time now as well as having operational impacts on performance, with us not meeting service levels and having a loss of confidence in our service. We want to avoid the disruption and effects on our reputation. If you can move forward again for me, please. Thank you. So this is my final slide, and I was just gonna give you a few examples to bring to life what we're doing in terms of designing a more resilient infrastructure. As I've already alluded to, the difference between HS2 and the legacy rail infrastructure, we have the opportunity to build climate resilience in at every step. So that's planning, design, constructing, operating and maintaining the railway. 
We're the first major infrastructure project to integrate climate change adaptation and resilience into our first environmental impact assessment for the phase one route between Birmingham and London. That's making sure the climate change was considered at the earliest opportunity and we can include risk mitigation and reduction throughout the design and construction phases. In design and construction, we are building adaptation and resilience into our standards. We require our contractors to complete climate change adaptation and resilience reports, which they must submit to us and update and resubmit at key design stages to make sure we're considering not only the HS2 infrastructure, but also the interdependencies with other infrastructure, such as drainage and electricity supply. We've also integrated the requirements into our standards. We've gone beyond the UK norm and we're putting climate change requirements for drainage design and bridge design, durability and flood risk into our standards to name just a few. We're also looking to protect the construction process from extreme weather. We, within our code of construction practice, we've required our contractors to sign up to the Environment Agency flood line if they work in high risk flood areas and they're to use short and medium term weather forecasting to manage their construction programme and make sure they plan their works when their weather is most suitable so that we can look to limit and mitigate the impact of any extreme weather. If I move forward to our station designs, which overlaps very much with some of the stuff that Marcel talked about, but we've already achieved Bream Outstanding certification for our Birmingham Interchange station design. We're looking at the architectural design to make sure it, we focus on sustainability, maximizing daylight, ventilation, and water efficiency. This has rainwater harvesting designed in and sustainable drainage systems. If you move to our old Oak Common station, we've looked at the floor and wall surfaces to make sure it can absorb incidental solar gain and minimize the rises in indoor temperatures so it becomes a more ambient and sustainable building. Looking at our landscapes, we have a fantastic example in the Colm Valley in the Chilterns. The Western Slopes are the biggest single landscape and habitat creation project within HS2. We will create 127 hectares of climate resilient landscape and achieve a biodiversity net gain of 10% for that local community. And that helps us contribute towards um, a local kind of stabilization. Flood resilience is also a focus for HS2 and making sure that where we're having to use concrete and slab track, we are not putting pressure on other local flood alleviation schemes. We have to look at what we do in terms of selection of the route, the structures that we build, and make sure the track is elevated. All of our tracks are set at one metre above a one in 1,000 year flood event. We're looking at water resilience. You may know there are 10 tunnels to be constructed across HS2, 10 miles under the Chilton, um, under the Chilton Hills alone. When we build tunnels, we use tunnel boring machines and a lot of water. In particular in the Chilterns, they need to operate 24 seven for three years and use circa 8 million cubic meters of water, which is the equivalent of 3,200 Olympic swimming pools. So we've looked at brand new innovation around water efficient tunnel boring technology to minimize that water use. We also have to use more to, water to carry away the excavated materials in slurry but we've built a recycling plant on site so we can clean the water and reuse it as much as possible to make sure that we're not drawing on the aquifer any more than needed and also to make sure we are limited from the impacts of drought in summer. They're just a few examples of where HS2 is taking climate and adaptation and resilience seriously in the design of the future railway, but in also how we build it. I look forward to hearing your questions soon. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That was uh, fantastic. Really fascinating to hear the uh, the steps that HS2 is taking to to deal with any potential risks associated with um, with climate change, and a very timely reminder of the socio-economic impact and the importance of the project for the country as a whole. Um, right, so we've got around about 15 minutes left, so I'll bring in uh, our panellists again. And again, there's plenty of time still to, to pose your questions. We've got a couple that will come to shortly, but firstly, just wanted to go around the panel with a couple of questions from our side. So starting with yourself, Marcel, again, really fascinating um, presentation around green roofing. And you mentioned some of the, some of the, um, 
the, the policy tools. So talking about the, the urban green factor. And the projects obviously that have been implemented across um, the UK and Europe, but if there are particular learnings for the West Midlands, I mean, what, what kind of things do you think you know, local authorities here need to be aware of when, when embarking on that type of project? Well, the, the, the biggest issue with any of these is often culture change. And sometimes people say, oh, we can't do that. People will be, people saying we can't afford it. And actually, if, if, it, if, you, if you put it into um, planning policy, um, each planning authority within the West Midlands could each, quite easily put it in as a, as a kind of a general expectation. Um, and it could be as simple as demonstrating how you're going to uh, improve your green infrastructure, or it could be as far as saying, here's your urban green factor score. So it, de it depends how big or far. Uh, there's no reason why a planning authority couldn't do that. They generally like to follow wider policy, either national or regional. So that's probably why it doesn't happen enough, but it, it could happen tomorrow. So we'd look to, you'd look to the wider spatial framework for uh, uh, Greater Birmingham and the West Midlands. And if, if, if that is, process is underway now, or it's looked up for renewal soon, I'd highly recommend that the, the powers that be who, who are looking at the wider spatial frameworks introduce a green, an urban greening factor. No, thank you for that. And obviously, the combined authority here in the West Midlands, their targets reaching at zero is 2041. So obviously, those conversations are happening right now. And it's something that I'm sure the mayor will discuss in the, the conference we're, we're holding next week. Um, Jessica, if I can bring yourself in, um, in your presentation, you mentioned obviously that supply chain is the big, biggest risk. Um, and really what I wanted to ask you is, how do businesses start to get a handle on that risk? Well, what would you say would be the first thing they'd need to consider on that process? I say bring in an expert, don't try and do it all yourself. Um, it's so hard as a business to get a handle on that. So we work with Carbon Footprint, who've done a supply screen, supply chain screening assessment. Oh, that's, a, that's a mouthful. Um, and they, they've given us a, a, an amount of carbon based on their, on their SIC code. So based on, on what industry they are. But what we're doing at Milton Reed, we... Um, we work with Echo Vardis and we complete an Echo Vardis assessment every year. But for us to do that outside, going the other way, it's £25,000 a year minimum. And now that we've been bought by Accenture, we can only see that going up and up. So what we've done is we've created our own solution internally that we've built on a platform that we already have to work with clients. We know that it's safe, we know that it's easy to use, it's user-friendly, it's intuitive. And actually what we're going to be doing is collecting all of the data from our top spend um, and asking them detailed questions, <clears throat> questions on their scope one, two, and three emissions, what targets they're putting in, how are they going to mitigate that, how do they report on it, but also including the, the S part, so about modern slavery, how they actually scrutinise their supply chain, but also do they have a diverse supply chain? So it's almost looking at the solutions that are out there that are paid, but also turning the lens on yourself to seeing what you've got already in place that you use to collect data and see whether there's an option to do that. Um, I was at a, a Legal Sustainability Alliance meeting the other week and we were all in the same boat. And I think across all industries, everybody's across the same uh, concerns with that, with that scope three. So look at paid solutions, but also look at what you've got internally and what knowledge you've got internally to try and collect that data. So you've at least got a bit more of a of a good standing to start to have those conversations with those suppliers that potentially aren't doing what they should be doing. Yeah, no, that, that's that's really helpful. Thank you for that. And, and Emma, just a quick question from 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 our side. Then, so obviously we, you mentioned obviously Russia, Ukraine, but thinking about the broader economic context and some of the challenges that we're facing right now, particularly when it comes to say rising levels of inflation, um, what impact does that have on some of the, the, the kind of mitigation factors you've got in place? I know we, we did an event with, with Mark First and the, the CEO of HS2 earlier in the year, and he talked about just the cost of, say, um, buying steel at the minute. It's kind of rocketed up. So does that have a practical implication on the work that you're doing when it comes to these this risk mitigation factors as well? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of factors when you come to things like material supply. You know, there's been a shortage nationally of some significant materials. So it's not just inflation it's also um, demand. Um, so we're having to work with our supply chain collaboratively to make sure that we secure 
good sources that we are that, that we are confident in in terms of supply but also in terms of standards um if i take things like diesel which has both moved away from red diesel you know to, to white diesel which already had an impact in terms of cost and traceability um we've then seen the massive increases as a result of ukraine as i've you know alluded to um actually it's really driven innovation so it's driven us to look at alternative fuel sources and do a lot of conversion which have become economically viable and have become yeah more sustainable in terms of financial forecast as well as in terms of environmental um, which is great it, we've been looking at all sorts of innovation with people like uh, car manufacturers for recycling of car batteries as an alternative to generators for fueling stuff on site you know looking at that kind of reuse opportunity um, I'm not going to lie though you know we are going to use concrete and steel because that kind of is the only way you can build a resilient infrastructure for over 100 years. But you need to make sure wherever you can, you minimise it, you use the best choices and you only use it where you need to. But we are investing quite a lot in looking at alternative methods. So, for example, can you 3D print concrete and reduce the volume? Can you make um, almost like connector kits of rebar so that you have no wastage and that they can be uh, minimised and reduce the amount? that you need to put into your infrastructure. All of that has suddenly become mainstream and more interesting because everybody's worried about supply and cost. So I've seen a real opportunity out of where we find ourselves. No, oh, that's yeah, it's really great to hear. And I think I read in the report as well that you're, is it using recycled wind turbines to reinforce the, the concrete as well, which is again, is, is really fascinating. So- Using balloons so that you don't uh, fill the spe the voids that don't need concrete for strength with anything other than air. I mean, there's some simple stuff out there you can do. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, right, so we've got a couple of questions that have just come in. Um, so, firstly, uh, Jessica, if I bring in yourself, uh, and then we've got a couple of questions on HS2. So, uh, Mike Freeberg of Postle is asking Mills and Reeve have demonstrated a number of frameworks being applied, but which standard other than ISO? 14001 are being used as a target. So we've just signed up to the United Nations Global Compact and as part of that we'll be aligning all of our activity to the Sustainable Development Goals and setting our key KPIs in line to that. Um, again, it's a brilliant, brilliant standard that we can sign up to and it also gives us that overview of all of our ESG activity and it also acts as that level of governance. Um, we are considering others but the, I think ISO 14001 is taking up so much of our time that we want to get that right, get the certification and then look at doing the other thing. As I said in my presentation, don't try and do everything. Um, ISO at the moment is like two days a week, of my four day a week job. It's, it's a lot and we want to get it right. And then actually then say, OK, right, we've done that really well. We've got the certification. We're doing the SDGs. What other, what other standards or frameworks can we add on? So we, we, want to, we don't want to run before we can walk because it's, it's just so huge that we, want to, we, we, we just want to get it right. <clears throat> no, it completely makes sense. Um, and we've got a couple of questions here on HS2. So um, if I bring in Emma here. So the first one is on the HS2 website, uh, where can we find sustainability guidance and requirements for suppliers? And the second question, is how is HS2 ensuring that the decarbonisation actions are effective and adhered to between now and the point where the infrastructure is complete and the line is operational? And that's from Cameron and Maria, that question. Thank you. Let me take the first one, the second one first, and then I'll say where it's all held afterwards. So um, there's a couple of things. In publishing our, um, in our carbon action plan, we've given ourselves clear milestones. So we're now held to account or we have things to be held to account too. Uh, we produce an annual environment and sustainability progress report. It's a requirement on us to lay that down in parliament um, and the HS2 minister must lodge that in parliament. So it's a very public facing document. We report um, data as well as case studies in that progress report. The data annex is fully validated externally by LRQA so that we make sure we're transparent and the data is credible and honest, which I think is really important. It enables us to explain where we've had successes and issues. If I give an example, there is a lot of focus on HS2 where we have an impact on ancient woodland, for example, 
it is absolutely minimal to the you know kind of scale of HS2 and the volume of woodland but it's really important that we are transparent in all of that reporting otherwise we will not be credible so our report is a huge part of that. As I've already touched on, we've got PAS 2080, which sits alongside something like 14001 certification that Jessica's talked about. But it's a specific management system for carbon. I have a carbon management office that monitors the progress we're making, implementing that and reports all that. And as I said, we've just got recertification with no findings. So at the moment, we are demonstrating good progress. We have a governance board, which sits as a subset of our main board called the Environment and Sustainability um, committee and they hold us to account and only next week I have to go and do an annual deep dive into our carbon performance where they make sure they're satisfied we're meeting our commitments so I mean a key message I'd have here is you need to be transparent because you won't be credible if you're not you have to report what's worked and what hasn't worked because this has never been done before so it's that honesty that will build the trust and credibility I think data speaks for itself and I think allowing external scrutiny, whether that's through certification or whatever, is all important in this journey. Now, I've talked about a number of documents. We have an environmental sustainability performance report annually. We have an environmental and sustainability vision. We have a carbon action plan. All of those are hosted on our public facing website, as are our standards and what you have to do if you're a contractor and want to work with HS2. Should be easily accessible from the first page, but I'm really happy to provide a link after this, which the Chamber can share with attendees. No, thank you, Emma, that'd be great. And then very quickly, as we're, we're coming up to 10 o'clock, I'll, I'll bring Marcel into this final question. It's a question from, from Amy Deakin. Uh, what's the most impressive green initiative you've seen so far, not necessarily at your own place of work? So I'm going to pick somewhere on another continent. And I have to say, I was blown away by the High Line in New York. This is a piece of um, uh, visionary kind of a, a green landscaping through a city centre and that, how that's transforming that bit of New York, which was definitely very not green a few, about 10, 20 years ago. No, thank you, Marcel. Well, that's been a fascinating session today. It really, it really has. I'd just like to finish by saying, obviously, thank you to um, our panellists, um, thank you to all of you for joining us and a couple of uh, quick requests on our side. Um, my colleague Curran will, will shortly put in a link to a survey that we're asking attendees to fill in, um, essentially just getting feedback on the sessions and where we can uh, look to improve our output throughout the sustainability conference and campaign uh, moving forward. Um, there are still uh, slots for everyone uh, to join next week, so please do sign up. Again, my colleague Curran can share details of the upcoming conference. And then finally, thanks to our sponsors, uh, Aston University, University of Birmingham and Shakespeare Bartido. And again, if you've got any further questions for myself or any of the panelists, please do email them to us. And again, as Emma said, we'll share the relevant links as well. But that's it from me. Thanks everyone. Have a great day and see you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much.